As we start our discussion here on deep ocean currents, let's revisit a couple things that we already know about density in terms of temperature um, in air, and then we can kind of apply that to the water. So there should be a section in your notes with these review questions for you to think about. Find it there and fill these in as we think about them. So thinking back to air pressure, we should be able to narrow down the temperature of air that is both more dense and less dense and most importantly, why? Why are those densities present? And when we think about the why, let's think about the molecules. How are they spaced to make that temperature more or less dense? So pause, fill in those blanks, and talk a little bit about why they have that density. We do know that in terms of density, the air that is more dense is the cool air, and that's because its molecules are so compact. They're much closer together. So when we think of molecules of a colder object, we tend to see the molecules much more compacted and closer together. But in terms of an object that is less dense, that should remind us we're talking about warm materials, where the molecules are much further apart. When warm materials are heated, the molecules then expand their space in between. Now the nice thing here about oceans is that water works in, in a similar way. We know that cooler water, just like air, is more dense. Okay, As warmer water, just like warmer air, is less dense. So how does the temperature of water impact the motion of water? Just like we saw in our lab that we created, our cool water is most likely going to sink down to the bottom of the ocean, where our warmer water is then going to be found near the upper parts of the ocean. So a quick review on temperature and density. Again, all things that we know from our Lane Cow air pressure discussion. So these deep ocean currents are driven by those temperature changes, which then changes their density. So two things that affect deep ocean currents and causes their flow throughout the oceans are temperature and salinity, which of course means amount of salt. And that was the third thing that we tested in our lab. We not only had hot water and cold water, but we also had salt water. So we should have a clue to how salinity affects density. When we add more salt to a material like water, what we notice is that the density increases. And we can see here on the graph that as we increase our percentage of salinity, we are also increasing our amount of density. So the more salt that is added, the higher the density is. And that's because we are putting more matter or more material into the same volume of water. All right, we are putting in salt crystals to those water molecules, adding to the density of the material. So when we look at the difference between fresh water and salt water, fresh water is going to be less dense because it's basically only the water molecules where the salt water we will see as more dense. So we know now how temperature and salinity are affected by density. Let's see the impact on that density in the currents. This is a map of the thermohaline circulation, where this blue here, this dark purple, these are my deep currents, and the white here, these are my surface currents. So I can see that this current drives the fluctuation of the oceans. And it takes about a thousand years for the water to circulate through that entire current both through the deep and the surface. Remember the deep being miles down,
cold water and the surface, that top 400 meters, much warmer water. That's why these currents are able to pass around the equator. They are so deep, they are not affected by the temperatures at the equator. Now this is called the thermohaline circulation because thermo means temperature and haline means salt or salinity. So really it's defined as the temperature and salt circulation. These densities are created by an increase or decrease in temperature as well as an increase or decrease in salt content. Sometimes we call that circulation the ocean conveyor belt. And if we look back at that picture, it definitely looks a lot like a conveyor belt, right? When one part of the ocean moves, another part is right there to fill in that empty space and continue pushing the process along. What we see here is that this process is responsible for moving warmer water from the tropics towards the cooler area at the poles. So the circulation is not confined to one small space, but again, if we look at that conveyor belt, the drive is happening all throughout the different parts, both deep and surface combining together. The deeper the water, the cooler, the salty it is. Now this is triggered by a region in the poles where what we have happening is at the surface, the water starts to freeze into ice. And that ice does not include salt. So we are left behind with really cold, really salty water that of course, based on its density, we know is going to sink. And that sinking triggers the motion of that thermohaline current or that thermohaline circulation. So again, this global circulation is driven strictly by the differences in densities between pockets of ocean water. And those densities are controlled by two things, temperature, warm and cool, and salinity, which of course is the amount of salt. Okay, and then just another diagram here showing where those temperatures end up. Here's my surface water, which of course is that nice red warmish color. And the further down I go, the cooler that water becomes. Now, deep ocean currents don't affect the climate as much as surface currents, but they do affect the area, depending on how the currents are flowing. We can have either upwelling or downwelling of a current, depending on how it interacts with the continent's coastline. You can imagine that an upwelling current is moving deep water to the surface, right? It's bringing material up. So what's happening here is it's hoisting up cold water, from below, and why that's so important is because that cold water is nutrient rich. The cold deep water has a lot of nutrients in it, making for really high productivity of marine life in an area with upwelling. So we wanna add some arrows in on here showing how the upwelling would occur at a location like this. We would have that underlying current come in, hit along this continental shelf, push upward, and then leave the continental shelf as a surface current. Again, because it's called upwelling, we see those currents moving up to the surface from deep below, bringing that cold nutrient-rich water up, causing for high productivity of marine life in that area. In reverse, downwelling, as you might imagine, is the movement of surface water downward. 
So here what we have is surface water, which is going to be warm in temperature, is getting pushed down the continental shelf because it came in as a surface current, but is forced downward and out into the deep ocean. Now it does seem a little strange to say that that warm water sinks, but remember it's being forced down. And this is not as um, prevailing of an area where I would see marine life. Warm water tends to be nutrient depleted. So these areas don't tend to have as much life around them. So make sure on your diagram there you label your downwelling with both a title and some arrows showing the motion of the air in that area, stating that this is not typically associated with a high productivity of marine life. So big picture here, we've got the global ocean conveyor belt working as one, the surface and the deep ocean currents send energy all across the globe with those temperature and salinity differences. They're working together to move that energy, that heat, from stored within those ocean currents, moving them around the globe to impact both marine life and, of course, bringing it back to lame cow, climate. So to wrap up the ocean discussion, we do have a few review questions there at the end of your packet. Make sure you get those completed. as we wrap up our lame cow discussion this week.